Hey everyone, Mr. Harvey here. Let's get started with our lecture today. We are starting with a, a, a new chapter today, ladies and gentlemen, chapter 14. Uh, and chapter 14, ladies and gentlemen, is really interesting and really important for us. We're going to uh, start uh, the chapter, today's lecture, talking about the Crimean War and some important developments and reforms within the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and then tomorrow's lecture, we're going to talk about arguably the most important part of this chapter, uh, the, uh, the unification of two new countries, Italy and Germany, uh, two uh, developments that I have kind of been foreshadowing uh, a lot in um, previous lectures and uh, the earlier part of this class. Uh, and then this uh, chapter kind of um, uh, ends with talking about some important reforms uh, within Russia and the rise of uh, British democracy and the development of British democracy. So we're chapter 14, we're in kind of in the late, uh, excuse me, mid to uh, late 1800s, uh, 19th century. And we're going to start off uh, by talking about the Crimean War. Now, this is not a picture of the Crimean War. This is uh, this is referring to Italian uh, unification. But you know, the the really one of the most important developments of this chapter of this time period is the unification of Italy, and more importantly, Germany. It's going to be a game changer. But we're we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so let me talk about the Crimean War, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you know, we haven't talked about war for quite some time. Uh, uh, the last major wars that we've seen in Europe, ladies and gentlemen, were the Napoleonic Wars. And then we saw Europe, you know, really react strongly um, against war, uh, right? We had that, that concert of Europe, that, con that Congress system. Um, uh, we haven't seen major wars. Now, for the Crimean War, ladies and gentlemen, is it super important to know for your AP exam? Not really. Uh, it's definitely not as important uh, as our Napoleonic Wars, you know, uh, Seven Years' War, Austrian Succession, Spanish Succession, Thirty Years' War. Uh, but the Crimean War is important for kind of uh, setting the tone for World War One, okay, and kind of really foreshadowing Europe going down that path, okay. So I I'm going to give you some specifics, um, and I want you to kind of understand the, uh, but I want you to really understand the big picture when it comes to the Crimean War, okay. Um, so. Uh, this is a, a three-year war. Uh, we're in the eight. Remember the mid 19th century, uh, mid 1800s to late 1800s. Uh, and the major cause, one of the major causes, was religion. There was dis a dispute between two groups of Christians, Roman Catholics and Greek Orthodox, over their privileges and kind of their uh, benefits they got from the Ottoman Empire within the Holy Land of Palestine. Okay, uh, so in the 1850s, the Ottoman Empire, uh, which controlled this area of Palestine, the Holy Land, uh, agreed to Napoleon. Uh, the third, who's in who's in charge now, uh, Napoleon III's demands to provide you know protection, benefits, privileges for Roman Catholics in the Holy Land. Well, Russia did not like uh, Napoleon III uh, doing this. Russia did not like uh, the Ottomans giving Catholics um, these benefits, these privileges, uh, because Russia thought that this you know that by the Ottomans doing this, that this threatened like an agreement that the Russians had with the Ottomans to provide you know the same thing for. Uh, uh, Greek Orthodox Christians. So, excuse me, Russian uh, Russia was very upset with this and did not like this. But a bigger cause, ladies and gentlemen, the, the, the more important cause here is that Russia wanted to extend their empire and their control over Ottoman provinces. Well, if, and, and if we remember, ladies and gentlemen, the Ottoman Empire is that sick man of the East. It's lost Serbia, it's lost Greece, it's losing territory, ladies and gentlemen. Russia it, uh, uh, the Ottomans, um, sorry, my dog is in the background uh, making some noise, um, but uh, Russia sees an opportunity, okay, with the Ottoman Empire slowly dying, and the Ottoman Empire will eventually die out uh, at the end of World War One, okay, but Russia sees an opening here, and an opportunity, uh, with the Ottomans losing uh, territory, with their weakness, and they want, the Russia wants to expand control over this, and remember, the Ottoman Empire um, you know, this is, this is a big problem, okay? This is a big problem for European countries. They don't know what to do because with the Ottoman Empire slowly losing its power, um, the balance of power, this balance of power within Europe could definitely be shaken up. And so um, this is a very, this is a very uh, delicate issue uh, within Europe. Okay, so in 1853, we're going to see the, uh, the Turks declare war on Russia. Uh, Nicholas I, the, the Tsar of Russia, is going to refuse to withdraw from Ottoman provinces. Uh, and in 1854, we're going to see Britain and France uh, respond by declaring war on Russia. And they, they are trying to maintain that balance of power. They don't want Russia to, you know, seize control of the eastern Mediterranean. Um, and uh, we're going to see Austria and Prussia really kind of remain neutral. Uh, and the reason why is because we're going to see uh, during this time, um, 
the, the unification of Germany is getting ready to happen. There's some, there's some tension within Austria and Prussia. Um, Austria is going to mobilize as a symbol of support, but the country that is important, that besides Britain and France and Russia getting involved in this, is, is there's a little country within Italy that's going to get involved, and that's Piedmont and Sardinia. Uh, this is in 1855. Piedmont and Sardinia is going to join the war supporting uh, France and Britain against Russia. And I'm going to talk about why tomorrow. Just, just kind of make a note of that in your notes. Circle it, star it. Uh, that's important for us, ladies and gentlemen, to understand. Okay, let's move on. All right, so uh, eventually, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see uh, Nicholas I. He's going to die, and his son, Alexander II, is going to take the throne and be open to peace. And so we're going to see this Treaty of Paris, okay? We're going to see some territorial changes, all right? Russia is going to surrender some territory near the Danube. Uh, Russia is going to um, uh, uh, renounce its claims to protect uh, the Greek Orthodox Christians. We're going to see the mouth of the Danube be internationalized. But there's a couple. There's another couple important implications from the Crimean War, and this is what I want people to know. Number one is the image of invincible Russia has been crushed. Uh, Russia has been kind of deemed, you know, this really powerful nation, and it is uh, since the time of Napoleon. Well, remember, Russia was very uh, important, especially uh, uh, when it came to the defeat of Napoleon. Um, was instrumental in helping defeat Napoleon, right? Remember, Napoleon's invasion of Russia was a massive failure, okay? Uh, but also, ladies and gentlemen, we're seeing here, and this has implications for World War One. Russia's, you know, Russia, uh, you know, uh, performance in this war, ladies and gentlemen, uh, was bad. And, um, and the reason is, ladies and gentlemen, is that Russia is behind. And warfare now, the Crimean War and the American Civil War, um, that's going to happen a little bit later, um, are some of the first industrialized wars, ladies and gentlemen, where we're seeing industrialism, mechanization, those components uh, that are developing within the Industrial Revolution being brought to warfare. And uh, well, if Russia's behind in those aspects of society, that's going to hurt them militarily. And we're going to see that in World War I, where they don't have the technology, where they don't have the modern weaponry. Um, and that's going to be a huge disadvantage for them and is going to lead to, you know, really uh, their defeat by um, their decisive defeats uh, in some of the battles um, and in the war by the Germans. So this is important, ladies and gentlemen, because the Crimean War is really foreshadowing that Russian weakness of industrialization that, that is now being brought to warfare uh, and that we're going to see in World War I. So Russia, really important for us, is behind you know, we know this when it comes to the Industrial Revolution. We know politically, economically, socially, but also militarily. And this is this is not good for them. Okay. Um, another important uh, point for this is that's really important. Uh, that's really uh, uh, vital for us, ladies and gentlemen, in the road to World War One is this concert of Europe way for dealing with international relations was shattered. This is so important for us, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. Uh, that concert of Europe, that Congress of Vienna, that Congress system where the European countries would meet. You know, try to talk things out, preserve the peace, work together. Uh-uh. And so we're going to see the European powers be a lot more reckless, unstable with foreign policy. And again, we are on the road to World War One. Eventually, we're going to see that recklessness, um, you know, translate into into World War One. And really, this is this is Europe just kind of, you know, forgetting about what went down with Napoleon and not, you know, just you know having that short short memory, just being like, all right, you know. Are we, you know, just being really reckless with war. And warfare is going to get much more deadly as we see the advanced weapons, the machine gun, you know, uh, uh, airplanes, um, you know, poison gas. Weapons are going to get more advanced with the Industrial Revolution, and Europe is being more and more reckless with their foreign policy. We are on the road to World War One, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, and the great powers feared revolution less than they had before. Revolution, ladies and gentlemen, is not going to play a, a bigger part uh, in... in um, uh, that uh, uh, within uh, kind of the sphere, we're going to see. Some, we are going to see some still some major revolutions, but the great powers aren't uh, are kind of finding out their own way to handle revolution. Um, but the big picture here that I really want people to understand is this recklessness with foreign policy. Very important for us. Okay, and we're going to see warfare, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, you know, especially on the on the uh, road to World War One uh, and in World War One, warfare is going to get kind of just insane. We're going to see just an insane suffering amongst the troops and the casualties will just be just out of control. And that, that's because we are seeing weaponry, you know, in correlation with the, uh, um, uh, or causation with the industrial revolution, weaponry is advancing. 
All right, let's talk about the Ottoman Empire, ladies and gentlemen. I mentioned the Ottoman Empire. We talked about them with uh, uh, in the previous chapters. You know, the sick man of the uh, of the East. It's hemorrhaging territory. It's losing territory. We eventually are going to see the Ottoman Empire, uh, you know, disappear. Um, uh, after uh, it's going to be, it's going to this this empire will be broken up uh, with their defeat in World War One. Uh, but the Ottoman Empire during this time, ladies and gentlemen, understands it's in trouble, and so it's going to there's going to be some reforms. The Ottoman Empire is going to try to reform and, and, and try to keep the empire to, uh, together, but um, it's it's going to be kind of too late and, and too tough. But let's talk about some of the things that they're going to try in order to keep this empire preserved. All right. Um, so the Napoleonic invasion of the Ottomans uh, in Egypt, ladies and gentlemen, sparked a drive for change within the Ottoman Empire. And so we're going to see this uh, uh, Ha'i Sharif uh, Guhain. Uh, this is going to be a reform that attempted to reorganize um, the empire along European lines. A.K.A. we're going to see the Ottoman Empire try to bring in some westernization, some enlightenment, some European influence in the hopes of that would help the empire stay together. And so this uh, Ha'i Sharif uh, Gohain is going to facilitate this thing, uh, this event, um, this change called the Tanzimat. Okay, and this was a reorganization of uh, of the empire. It's going to liberalize the economy, aka some capitalism, aka the Enlightenment. Um, we're going to see the uh, ending of tax farming, freedom of religion. So, so we're seeing some Westernization, some Enlightenment within the Ottoman Empire. Why? Well, the Ottoman Empire knows that it, times are changing. Europe, uh, there's a lot of European influence in the Ottomans, especially with uh, the Ottomans in interacting more with Europe. So this is just show showcasing some change and some influence. Um, we're also going to see within these reforms, the, the Tanzimat and the uh, Hat uh, I Sharif Al Gohain, um, we're going to see this extension of civil equality to the Ottoman subjects, regardless of their religion. So uh, freedom of religion, Muslims, Christians, Jews will be equal uh, before the law. And it's going to be easier for uh, uh, Muslims to enter into commercial agreements with non-Muslims within the empire and abroad. So some serious changes. Big picture here, ladies and gentlemen, westernization. And we're also seeing some uh, enlightenment influence within the Ottoman Empire in the hopes of the Ottoman Empire trying to change in order to, uh, you know, preserve their empire, which we know is not going to be able to happen. Okay. Uh, we're also going to see the Hati uh, Humayun. Uh, and this is going to spell out rights for non-Muslims. All right, so we're going to see equal chances for non-Muslims and Muslims within the military, state employment, and admission to state schools. We're going to see the abolishment of torture. Definitely, ladies and gentlemen, an enlightenment influence right there. Uh, giving property rights to foreigners, enlightenment influence uh, there. Uh, we're going to see more printing presses uh, within the Ottoman Empire. And as, as we can tell, more European influence um, uh, within the Ottoman Empire. And so the Ottoman Empire did this for a couple reasons. Number one was to gain the loyalty of Christian subjects because there are some Christian um, uh, subjects within uh, the uh, uh, Ottoman Empire as well as there are Jewish subjects within the Ottoman Empire. And they're doing this to stave off nationalism. They don't want all these different uh, groups, uh, religious groups, uh, ethnic groups to want their own uh, country. And so they're, they're giving, you know, not, they're, they're, they're making these reforms, uh, giving these freedoms uh, to people in order to try to preserve their 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 empire, much like um, uh, we see in other countries, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, and they and you can see, ladies and gentlemen, also with the Ottoman Empire that you know they have similar motivations kind of to Austria, and they have a similar problem to what Austria has, right? With all those ethnic groups, the Ottomans uh, are trying to make these reforms um, in order to preserve their um, their empire. Okay. Um, however, putting these reforms into practice is going to prove very difficult. We're going to see, um, you know, local rulers, you know, were basically virtually independent of the Ottoman Empire, and uh, a lot of these local, some of the, or not a lot of them, but some of these local rulers are going to be very hesitant and not wanted to do this. And so um, we're going to see the uh, the implementation of some of these reforms um, not go down the way that the Ottoman Empire wants it to go down. And um, and so we're going to see, uh, you know, the Ottomans are going to try to work with the European powers to reform. But some of the local leaders, um, uh, local magistrates are not necessarily going to want to reform. Um, and there's going to be tensions between this European-oriented reform and Islam-based tradition. And so there's going to be some religious tension, some social tensions uh, within these reforms. And uh, the big picture here that I want people to understand, you don't need to memorize all this, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, is to understand the Ottoman Empire is really desperate for change, really threatened by nationalism, 
and 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 understands that it's in a perilous position of losing the empire. Okay, um, and over the 19th century, like I said, is going to attempt to modernize and secularize, uh, but it's going to lose a lot of its holdings in Eastern Europe. And we know, ladies and gentlemen, eventually the Ottoman Empire will break apart after the defeat in World War One. Okay, all right, and some reforms within the Ottoman Empire. All right. We're going to stop here for today, ladies and gentlemen. In the next lecture, I'm going to focus on Italian unification and German unification. Thank you so much.